Last week we uh, pretty much finished up through two, uh, chapter 2, verse 13. Talking about uh, judgment will be merciless to one who has shown no mercy. Mercy triumphs over judgment. So uh, a reminder from James that, hey, if you want God to forgive you, you need to be forgiving of the people that are that are around you. Um, and then we, at the very end of that section, we kind of talked about, because it starts with partiality, and uh, at the very end we uh, kind of add a little bit more on um, what sometimes we, we think of discrimination as being a form of partiality, and it can be, but God asks us, tells us to be discriminating in certain things. Okay? Discriminate between sin and not sin. And stay away from that one. Make a decision. Okay. And, uh, and, so, and, and so he tells the, uh, the brethren in, in Corinth, look, you've got somebody among you that has his father's wife. That is not a good thing. Get rid of them. That calls for a decision to be made. Okay? So there are times where we, if, as long as we are using God's standard, okay, then discrimination is not a bad thing. We're doing what God tells us to do. So, Okay, today we're going to uh, pick up in verse 14, and uh, in, in my heading, uh, it kind of talks about faith and works, and then working together, and we'll, we'll get into all of that. Um, so, I, I've kind of titled this section, Faith Proves Itself Through Works. I'm not a, really a, a big fan <laughs> of that. Um, kind of depends depends on how you understand the word proves. Um, the, uh, it's hard to capture the relationship between faith and works. It's a little bit like, uh, I was trying to think of this yesterday, what's the best way to understand this? And in, in my mind, have you ever tried to pinch one side of a coin? You can't do that, can you? Okay. Trying to separate faith and works, and I think this is the point that he's kind of making here. Trying to separate these things is a very, very difficult thing to do because they are so tightly related to one another. Uh, they go together like the two sides of a coin. They, they work together to accomplish what needs to be need to be accomplished. This section here, 14 to the end of the chapter, I think it, it's kind of in the middle of James. I think it's the real meat of what James is talking about. Okay? Almost everything else in the book, or a lot of as in his letter, is uh, are kind of examples of how faith and works play out. Okay, so this it's it's all important. This is also really really important. Like I say, it's kind of the meat of uh, of what is in his letter. So let's uh, let's go ahead and read uh, 14 to 26, 13 verses. What use is it, my brethren, if a man says he has faith but he has no works? Can that faith save him? If a brother or sister is without clothing and in need of daily food? And one of you says to them, Go in peace, be warmed and be filled. And yet you do not give them what is necessary for their body. What use is that? Even so, faith, if it has no works, is dead, being by itself. But someone may well say, You have faith and I have works. Show me your faith without the works, and I will show you my faith by my works. You believe that God is one, you do well. The demons also believe and shudder. But are you willing to recognize, you foolish Abraham, our father, justified by works, when he offered up Isaac, his son, on the altar. You see that faith was working with his works, and as a result of the works, faith was perfected. And the scripture was fulfilled, which says, And Abraham believed God, and it was reckoned to him as righteousness, and he was called the friend of God. You see that a man is justified by works, and not by faith alone. And in the same way was not Rahab the harlot also justified by works, when she received the messengers and sent them out by another way. For just as the body without the spirit is dead, so also faith without works is dead. He starts off in, in, uh, in verse 14, he kind of has two, uh, two questions. They're somewhat rhetorical, meaning they don't really expect an answer, because the answer is, is so obvious. Um, that, uh, they ought to be obvious <laughs> okay, when we read through these things. Um, so, what use is it, my brother, if man says he has faith, but he has no works? Can that faith save him? So he's kind of talking about a dead faith. Okay, a faith that is all by itself without any works whatsoever. Is that going to save him? Um, and 
then in verses uh, 15 through 25, he's going to give examples that reinforce his point. And in 26, he's going to appeal to the natural world, what everybody understands about the natural world, to, uh, to, to uh, finish off his, his point. The body without the spirit is dead. Okay, We all understand that. When the body is laying there, it doesn't matter if it's a dog or a human, if the spirit is not there, okay, it's dead. It's just a, just a carcass. He makes that same case. He uses that to make the case for faith and works, how closely they are, they are related. Now his, uh, um, so he frames the issue in verse 14 and 26, talking about faith without works. And then he asks these two questions, and then the abundantly obvious point, even though he, I don't think he says it directly, but he's very, very close to it, a dead faith cannot save you. Okay? And a dead faith, he defines as a faith that has no works attached to it. So, And then, his first example, in verses 15 and 16, if a brother or sister is without clothing in need of daily food, and one of you says to them, go in peace, be warmed and be filled, and yet you do not give them what is necessary for their body, what use is that? Uh, I, when, I, when I read this, I always think of, you know, winter time in the North Country, and somebody knocks at your door, hungry, without any clothes on, what are you going to do? Good luck! And close the door again? No, of course not. I mean, it's just so far into the ridiculous. We would not do that. Um, and so he, he makes the point. If you don't do anything to help your brother or sister when they're in need, then you are your faith is backed up with nothing whatsoever. It's an empty faith. There is uh, there's, there's a, good wishes without good action is, is useless. Has no use whatsoever. Um, turn over to the book of Ephesians. Most of the time, I uh, I don't spend a lot of time. I think in teaching, going different places to make a point when the point can be made right from the passage that we use under study. Uh, there are some that are just so clear, though. In Ephesians two, chapter uh, chapter two, verse ten, uh, Paul says this to the brethren there. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. And we, we talked about this when we were studying through Ephesians. This, this is a very clear statement, I think, especially to me. This is why you're here, to do good to other people. God put you here for that purpose. And God beforehand. Okay? He set them in front of you so that you would do these good things. If we ignore doing those good things, we are really ignoring the, uh, the, uh, the path that God has uh, uh, laid out for us, the things that he, he prepared. I mean, is Paul in agreement with James? <laughs> He's in perfect agreement with James here, isn't he? I mean, there's no, there's no question about it. I, I think he does a good job of saying, which book was written first, by the way? Probably James. Probably, James is probably one of the very earliest uh, books that were written. So, um, in that respect, some of Paul's writing might be a little bit of a not a response to maybe, maybe a clarification or you know, how some people were misusing the things that James wrote. Um, so, the first example: you got a brother and sister in need. Our job is to help them. In verses 17 through 19, he's going to reinforce uh, this principle. So he's going to step back from the example, talk about the principle again. And in 17, even so faith, if it has no works, is dead, being by itself. But someone will may well say, if you have faith, I have works. Show me your faith without the works. And I will show you by my works. If you believe that God is one, you do well. The demons also believe Faith by itself is dead, and he you know, says this at the end too, just in 26, but just as the body without the spirit is dead, so also faith without works is dead. So he's kind of making the same point three times through this passage, so make sure we understand that. Uh, I have faith, but I have works. There's three points about this. One of them is that without your works, your faith is what? Invisible, right? There is no evidence whatsoever unless we are working our faith out. Okay? It's invisible. 
It cannot be seen. Another thing is, my works are the obvious outcome of my faith, proving that my faith exists. Kind of gets back to the title a little bit, proof. Um, what does it say about the works of the atheist, though? Because this is something I really struggle with. You see somebody who's rejected God, and they're doing good things. Okay. You have faith, I work. Show me your faith without the works. It says, which cannot be done. I'll show you my faith by my works. But if you have uh, all the good things I do, even though I reject God. There, there's where purpose matters. It, it does. I mean, that, the, yeah. purpose, the purpose we do good works is because God has instructed us to do that. Yeah. That God do that. He may be doing it for a total different reason because he wants to, let's say, save the planet or whatever. The thing if for the atheist who stands there doing something good, but at the same time is and, and uh, you know in his face and saying, I know you don't exist, and um, God's not impressed. <laughs> okay, He created us, He put enough evidence out there for us to understand that He exists in this world, and when a person rejects all that evidence, turns around and shakes their finger in God's face and says, I know you don't exist, I'm doing good. Does God, is God impressed with that behavior? Not at all. And so the, the good works are really of no effect. John? If God doesn't even exist, then why is it good? What makes it good? What, why, what's yeah, it? yeah. What's the standard? Okay, what's the standard you're going to judge things by if God doesn't even exist? Because there, if God doesn't exist, there's no moral decision criteria out there by which to judge good and bad. So, um, turn over uh, back a couple pages in your Bibles to Hebrews 11, a verse we have seen many, many times. And here, and this is something I think speaks directly to the, the quandary that an atheist doing good things finds themselves in. Themselves in. Hebrews 11, 6. <clears throat> and without faith it is impossible to please him, for he who comes to God must believe that he is, that he is a rewarder of those who seek him. It's impossible to please God. It doesn't matter how many good things we do, okay? If we don't have faith in God, those are of no no credit to us whatsoever. Now, the person we do the good thing to may be better off because of it, okay? I'm not, not rejecting that idea. The, the question is the relationship between the worker of that good deed and God. Okay, that's the, that's the point of the thing. Now, contrast that with a, an ignorant, honest seeker. And I'm not talking stupid. I'm not using ignorant that way, but a person who just does not know. Okay. Yes, exactly. Cornelius. Right? We have, we have the, the story of Cornelius in Acts 10 where he was trying to do the right thing, but he was ignorant. Okay, trying. Everybody spoke well of him because he was trying to do the right thing, but he was he was ignorant. He just did not understand. And so God intervened, didn't he? God sent Peter, and you know the rest of the story. It's there in Acts ten. Um, so the uh, that, I think there's there's comfort in that because if we are if we ever find ourselves in the same situation, <laughs> okay. God has a way of accomplishing His will in us still. So it also answers the, the question, to me anyway, of does God hear the prayer of someone who is a, a, a full of unbeliever, okay, who is, is still in ignorance? Well, there's, I think there's got to be a distinction drawn there. Yeah. There's one who's seeking. Or he was obviously seeking. Yeah. God sent, yeah. sent to him. There's yeah. one who rejects God has no, no interest in following God at all. Yeah. And God's not going to hear that, that, that person's prayer. Right. There, there, there's kind of the distinction there. Right. And is it in Acts 17 where, where Lee goes to and it says, uh, God, uh, or uh, those who seek him, or it was Hebrews 11, 6 also says that, but Acts 17 is, I guess, where it says, the, uh, put us at a certain place in time. Right, right, right. Okay. Okay. Uh, any other thing about 17 or 18? Let's look at 19 again. You believe that God is one, you do well. 
The demons also believe in shudder. <laughs> hmm. Okay. It's good to believe in God, uh, but even the demons believe in God. How do we know they're demons? By their behavior. Yes. Yeah, right. Their works. <laughs> okay. Their works is that they do is what proves them to be demons. Um, and their faith at least causes them to shudder. And I understand, you know, when we talk about demons, I, I, I think he is referring to the demonic world. Okay? The, basically the, the messengers of Satan. Okay? They, they are not of the same nature as human beings are. Okay? I don't think they have, uh, I don't think they have the ability to repent and do the things that God causes all of them calls on humans to do, okay? Um, but the, the point is still there. Um, even though they're of a different nature, they still have the ability to believe in God. They know that God exists, and they shudder because of it. Okay? We, should, we should shudder also if we have not complied with God's demands on us. Um, we do see a lot of demonic behavior amongst mankind. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I was just thinking, your thought was in my head because think of James. Where is James? He's in Jerusalem. Yeah. He's surrounded by what? The Pharisees and Sadducees who yeah. totally rejected. Yeah. They believed in God, yes, but did they believe God when he sent his son? Right. No. No. Rejected. He, yeah. he had them in mind when he maybe? Yeah. yeah. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. I, I, you know, the, the initial thing or the, the point he's trying to make. Hey, belief is not enough. Right. Okay? You have to have behaviors that go along with that faith. Itself out in a way. To the extent that the demons were perhaps the, the spiritual element itself, they didn't need faith. Right? Yeah. But belief, belief was not enough to save them. Obviously, if they're demons, their behavior is bad. But I think this illustration is useful in understanding that, look, in this instance, you can eliminate the concept of faith, of faith altogether to, to kind of, what's what I'm looking for when you, when you like isolate the idea that, look, the belief was there. They don't need faith at all, and there's still not faith. Now, if, if, if belief is there and they are not saved, and they're not ones that need faith because they're, they're spiritual beings, therefore, what's missing? The works. The works. So you, it, it kind of separates idea in terms of our where we're at humanly, situationally, and says, look, well, belief, yes, but not enough. In this conversation of faith, but, but, but where's the works? The works aren't there. Yeah. Okay. Um, okay. Since it, since it does say that they do have a, they, they believe in God, okay, what is it, that, what's the point that James is kind of making in here about Describe their faith. Dead. 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 <laughs> okay, it's a dead faith. <laughs> Back this faith up. Okay, right. so he's taking this example in the spiritual world and making sure that we understand it in the in the physical world. Okay. So, okay, we go through nineteen. Okay. Uh, Okay. 20 through 25. Now he's going to. Uh, uh, he's, he's talked about this principle. Now he's going to jump into some examples again of, uh, of, of how this is going to work out. And so he starts. Um, he's, he's going to introduce uh, the example that is going to be of Abraham. And in verse 20. Well, let's read 20 through 25. Are you willing to recognize, you foolish fellow, that faith without works is useless? Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered up Isaac his son on the altar? You see, the faith was working with his works, and as a result of the works, faith was perfected. And the scripture was fulfilled, which says, And Abraham believed God, and it was reckoned to him as righteousness, and he was called the friend of God. You see that a man is justified by works, not by faith alone. And in the same way was not Rahab the harlot also justified by works when she received the messengers and sent them out by another way. Let me start by saying, uh, just overall, he says, Abraham, our father, okay, in verse 21, probably this kind of reinforces uh, the idea that he's writing to Jewish Christians who would understand this reference, okay? 
a Gentile, dude, not my father. Right. You know, so. Um, let's see. And then by bringing in Rahab the harlot also, a Gentile, would they have a ready grasp of that? Probably not. A Jewish Christian? Sure. Um, he says, uh, let's see. Are you willing to recognize, you foolish fellow? <laughs> Pretty strong language, isn't it? Okay. Does it uh, um, does it violate Matthew five twenty two? It's an interesting question. I, I think turn over to Matthew five twenty two. This is an interesting question. Yeah, this, this is a uh, sermon on the mount, and he's talking about relationships with other people. And Jesus says, "But I say to you that everyone who's angry with his brother shall be guilty before the court." And whoever shall say to his brother Raka shall be guilty before the Supreme Court. And whoever shall say, you fool, shall be guilty enough to go into the fiery hell. That's the New American Standard version of, uh, of that right there. Um, in, uh, in 522, fool uh, is kind of a final judgment on somebody. It's a, it's a real condemnation. Right. And uh, that when you when you pronounce final judgment on a person, <laughs> well, they're still alive, or even when they're gone, um, you are putting yourself in that judge's seat where God belongs and God alone belongs. Uh, the uh, in James two twenty uses a different word, a different Greek word there, kinos, and it means uh, empty. So in a sense, in what, what James is kind of saying here, you. You empty of reason, fellow. You, you know, if you're not if you're not reasoning correctly, you're unable to reason. Are you really willing to say that faith without works is uh, well? Are you willing to recognize that faith without works is useless? I think he's making a case that is very obvious, and he's kind of saying, "Look, if you're not willing to recognize that you're you're kind of being empty-headed or empty of reason in your uh, in your logic." So. I, I always thought it was a little bit of a harsh, harsh statement to uh, come across with, but he's trying to make a point too. So, um, verses twenty-one to twenty-three is where he he uh, gets into uh, Abraham, and he uses uh, two events from the life of Abraham to make the point that he's trying to make. He looks at them in reverse order. Okay, we're gonna we're gonna change the order a little bit and deal with the. Uh, chronologically, first one. In verse 23, um, the scripture was fulfilled which says that Abraham believed God and it was kept reckoned to him as righteousness and he was called the friend of God. Turn over to Genesis. Genesis 15. 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 This particular verse in, uh, in 23 is a, a uh, from verse 6 of chapter 15. But let's go back and look at this, starting in uh, chapter 15, verse 1 of Genesis. After these things, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision, saying, Do not fear, Abram. I'm a shield to you. Your reward shall be very great. And Abram said, O oh Lord God, what wilt thou give me? Because I'm childless, and the heir of my house is Eliezer of Damascus. And Abram said, Since thou hast given no offspring to me, one born in my house is my heir. Then behold, the word of the Lord came to him, saying, this man will not be your heir, but one who shall come forth from your own body. He shall be your heir. And he, God, took him, Abram, outside and said, Count the stars if you are able to count them. And he said to him, So shall your descendants be. Then he believed in the Lord, and he reckoned it to him as righteousness. So there's the, there's the reference that, uh, uh, that James uses in verse. promises Abram a great reward. Abram kind of comes back and says, uh, well, good's a reward if I don't have anybody to pass it on to. Um, the uh, God takes him outside the tent at night, have him look up at the sky and says, your descendants are going to be as numerous as the stars that you can see. More numerous than that, it turns out. But what actual evidence did God Abram at that point so that he would believe. Not yet. No, not a shred. 
okay? Not a shred of evidence. What would have been evidence? What might have been evidence? A child. Yeah, a child, or, or even having Sarah walk around the corner with her belly out to here, right? Hey, you weren't that way this morning, you know? And now you are. I am kid, okay? He doesn't give him that, does he? He doesn't give him anything other than, other than his word, okay? But... Believed God, and God credited to credited it to Abram as righteousness uh, at that moment. So, um, based solely on His promise, Abram believed. God reckoned reckon means counted it or credited it to him as righteousness, and he was called a friend of God. Okay, um, fairly early on. I don't know how many years separate these two events. But this happened before. The, sec the uh, first thing that he's actually talked about back in James is uh, in verse chapter 2, verse 21. Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered up Isaac his son on the altar? Okay. So the, the one event, the promise is made before Isaac is ever born. I don't know how many years it was. And I I didn't go back, and it seems like somewhere I've got it kind of written down, different events in, in Abram's life. Uh, but 12, 15, 20 years, maybe, between these two events. And a lot of things have happened in Abram's life in between. Okay, um, Just to give you an idea of some of those. Um, because he's, he's going to sacrifice his son. And there have been other things that Abram has been called on to do that have reinforced his faith before the sacrifice. Okay, um, Circumcision came in between. You, you want me to do what? Him and his household. Right. Everybody. Um, sending away Hagar and Ishmael. Abram didn't hate Ishmael. Uh, but he was told to send him away. And he did. There are some failures in there too, aren't there? You know, Abimelech. Okay. Um, but the greatest test of his life, I think, is going to be the sacrifice of his son. You know, go to the land I will show you. That would be nothing in comparison to I want you to sacrifice your son. Okay. But how many ever years it is down the road, I, I tend to think that uh, Isaac is still a reasonably young man, somebody that could be overpowered and tied up by his father and laid on the altar. I'd be, I'd be fighting like crazy, right? Any of us would. Um, so the, uh, the difference in time between the promise and the sacrifice, Abram has had time to grow. His works have been reinforcing his faith. His faith has been, has, has been reinforcing his works. Um, and James is asking the question in verse 21 there, uh, does not Abraham's willing obedience prove his faith. He's, he's willing to do it. God has told him. He's willing to do it. God made a promise to him that your descendants are going to be like the stars through him. But you're asking me to kill him. That's the ultimate test. Okay. So Abraham is having to trust. Abraham's trust is proved by what he is this work that he is uh, being called upon to do. Um, his obedience does not allow for any unfaithfulness in there, does it? Right? It's, it's the ultimate act of faith here in this situation for him to uh, be willing to uh, uh, carry through with this. And in verse 22 he says, you see that faith was working with his works, and as a result of the works, faith was perfected. There's a whole lot of working going on in there. Um, but faith was working with, cooperating with, Faith was a fellow worker, is kind of what this word uh, actually means with his works. And the faith was perfected, uh, made complete, accomplished, consummated, fulfilled, brought to perfection. Those are the ideas behind the idea of his faith. Um, so, just, uh, was Abraham justified by living faith or a dead faith? Living faith. Living faith. Are we justified by living faith or a dead faith? A living faith. Okay, that's the point that James is getting across to the people he's writing to, which includes which includes us. Um, 
Now he, uh, let's jump to verse 24. We'll skip 23, or uh, jump to 25, where Rahab is. Uh, Rahab the harlot, in the same way was not Rahab the harlot also justified by works when she received the messengers and sent them out by another way. James doesn't give her you know, as much space in here. Uh, the reference is, is uh, pretty plain. Um, one of the things that came across to me yesterday when I was reading this is that uh, who, who did Rahab eventually become? In, in the lineage of Christ. Okay. I, I tend to agree with you. Is that an assumption or a fact? Look at home because you won't find it. <laughs> okay. Um, the Rahab is, seems to, uh, it never says that it's Rahab the harlot that marries Salmon. Salmon and Rahab have a son named Boaz. Boaz marries Ruth. Okay, so uh, there, there is the perspective there that this may be the same Rahab, and I, I tend to think it is. The timing is right. She appears in history at about the time, okay? But I, I could not find anything there that made it a, an absolute done deal, okay? If somebody wanted to make the point that I wouldn't argue with them, they want to make the point that it is. Uh, I guess all I'll say is we have to be careful about the assumptions we're making as we, we read through something. It's not a, not a, a done deal. Um, so, how would you describe her faith? Let's go ahead and turn to Joshua, chapter 2. He's, he's bringing her up. Okay, James is bringing her up as an example of her faith and her works working together. Chapter 2, verse 9. Um, uh, the men have come and visited her. They are... Before they lay down, she came up to them on the roof and said to the men, I know and that the terror of you has fallen and that all the inhabitants of the land have melted away before you. Um, 10. For we heard how the Lord dried up the water of the Red Sea before you when you came out of Egypt and what you did to the kings of the Amorites who were beyond the Jordan to Sion and all destroyed. And when we Okay. Is Rahab the only one that knows what's going on in terms of why the Israel? They've all understood what is going on. So her faith is quite strong. Now, what are her works? She hides the guys. Okay, why? Because that the Lord has given you the land. Given, past tense. It, for her, it is as much of a done deal as the sun rising that morning. I know that this is going on. Yes. All of us really understand this. Um, but she didn't turn the spies over. She aided them, helped them escape. And uh, what everybody else there who understood the same thing, how did their works reinforce their faith? Not at all. They did absolutely nothing. You know, the whole city could have risen up and told the king, we need to give up and plead for mercy because the Lord is behind us. They seem to understand it, but they did absolutely nothing about it. James is saying, hey, her faith and her works reinforced one another, and because of that, she she was rewarded. Okay, She and her family okay, were given their lives. And probably she went on to be in the in the lineage of Christ. So um, now let's jump back to 24. You see the man is by the works and not by faith alone. So the two examples he's given, he says, "Look, I'm talking about Abraham. I'm talking about Rahab. This is very sufficient for you to understand that faith and works work together, um, and it's faith and works cooperating, reinforcing one another. Those are the things that justify us uh, before God." slides a little bit. The conclusion, when it comes right down to it, is that, look, Christians behave differently. Why do they behave differently? They do different works than either what they did before they became Christians, okay, or compared to the rest of the world. They behave differently because their works reinforce. Um, they, it, 
It's the kind of thing that those works bring us to maturity. Um, so, pretty simple so far, isn't it? You know, I, I think you can read through this thing and it's just clear. Even on the first, first glance, it's just a, a very, very clear sort of thing. But there's a debate, <laughs> okay? And uh, there's a great debate really in history. It still goes on a little bit, mostly among the trackers now. But uh, it's about whether or not even the book of James belongs in the canon, in the scriptures. Luther struggled with this a lot. Um, Albert Barnes says that Luther early on said, get rid of James because it says faith without works is dead. Um, and, uh, and Barnes says that later on he kind of recanted of that. I, I think I read something that uh, the Lutheran Bible still has James and several other books at the end. You know that? I, I read that, that uh, the Lutheran Bible is set up that way uh, because he kind of called them semi-inspired. <laughs> I think it's semi-inspired. That's kind of an interesting uh, concept. Well, God half inspired that book. No. All the way inspired. So here, here's the issue though. James and James 2.24 and a couple other places in there that we looked at. You see that a man is justified by works and not by faith alone. In Romans, Paul says, by the works of the law, no flesh will be justified in sight from works of the law. And then in 5.1, therefore, having been justified by faith, there are other verses out there where he kind of makes the same sort of a point where he seems to be saying that you can't work your way to heaven. Okay? Faith, faith, faith. Um, and so... These, these different perspectives out there, and, and the, the writing goes back a long, long way to people who would say these two people disagree with one another, and so we need to hold, throw the whole thing out. Uh, I think one of the things I saw was Voltaire. You kind of heard Voltaire as a name back sometime, and he uh, ends up this argument that because these two guys disagree on the face of things, you can't trust. There are pretty easy ways to reconcile this. Um, the, uh, and, and the easiest one to me to understand is that they, they're writing from different perspectives. Okay, they're looking at different things. Um, and, and you see this kind of in here, works of the law. Okay, what's, what's Paul talking about? Man is justified by faith apart from works of the law. He's talking about the old law. Okay, he's making a case against the old law. Nobody was ever justified by the sacrifices of goats and that, that never worked out. Um, the, uh, but James is speaking to a perspective of the new law. Okay? And so his perspective is uh, uh, life under the new law. What kind, of, uh, what kind of a faith is it that actually saves you? And not a dead faith, but a living faith that, that shows itself in uh, works. Now, when Paul, let me go back here. Part of the point that Paul is making is that, look, the law is not us anywhere. It was, it was, a, it was a difficult burden. Um, the punishment for sins was never really uh, satisfied. It was just forestalled. And, and Paul says that Abraham was justified by his faith. When? Long before the law of Moses ever came onto the scene. So how can he have been justified back here faith if works of obedience to the law was key in satisfying God. Okay, so jumping way back to the beginning of the thing, kind of cutting that, that Gordian knot and saying, hey, look, look at this right here. Um, James is answering the different question. What is the nature of faith that justifies us? Okay, and that's why he says faith without works is dead. Faith without works is dead. It's an active faith. It's a living faith. It's a faith that embodies some effort. Um, there, there, uh, there's work that, that is done because of our faith. There are changes in behavior as signs that, yeah, this person has a legitimate faith. A dead faith gets us nowhere. And so Paul, James says, faith without works is dead. If you look at in a sense, he almost switches the two things. It's works without faith is dead. Okay? Now, Paul never comes out and explicitly says that, but look at Paul's life. Because at one time, he was a persecutor of the church. All kinds of work 
in ignorance, thinking it was the right thing, but it was from a dead faith, a faith that had no effect whatsoever. Well, all of his work <laughs> up until that conversion time was worthless. Okay? It did harm to the church. Now, God used that. Um, so, so there's the things. They're different perspectives. They're looking at different perspectives, trying to describe different things. Okay? And they, they do reconcile pretty easily. There, there are other more involved ways to reconcile. Um, I'm a simple man. <laughs> I don't understand some of those involved. You know, some of the arguments halfway through. Even Lutheran, Luther wrote a thing where later on he understood a little bit better. And I could follow about half of the argument, partially because archaic language and partially just because he was getting pretty complicated. Luther was not an uneducated man. So, and uh, we're coming up on 501 years now. Right. right? The end of October will be 501 years since he nailed his 95 theses on the, the door. Kind of, kind of got a big kick to the, uh, the cross. Okay. Uh, let's see. saved by works. We're not saved by works. We are strengthened by works, though, and they, I think that there are different kinds of 
works. There are works of merit. And when someone is talking about that, you think you're earning your way to heaven. That's a work of merit, and we absolutely reject that idea. It is not a work of merit. Where that ever came up with? Whoever came up with that? I, have, I just have no idea. But it is a work of obedience. Okay? It involves an action. Okay? Action is an obedient reaction to what God has asked us to do. We're being obedient. It is a work in the sense that we are having to actually do something. Okay? But it's not a work of merit. Okay? It, you know, it's just, it's just not. And, but that's, you know, probably the most common thing that we, we sort of see when we end up discussing um, uh, the necessity of baptism and why we believe it's there. So... Okay. Any other comments? John. Every word of Jesus is work of merit. Because he never did the first work of merit and getting sent to hell. So you could continue to do something good. And God, you promised that if I do it, he's going to do the kind of thing that you would give me that. Yeah. I've continued to do it. In John 17, he's praying, God, I've done your work. Glorify me like you said you would. He deserved it. If we if we do somehow begin to understand that these are works of merit, where's the need for faith anymore? Right. Nowhere. Right. There's nothing that merits my salvation. That's not the Bible anywhere. Okay? It's just absolutely not. So, because without faith, it's impossible to please Him. Okay, I took four minutes from you last week, and I'll give one back. Next week we'll start in uh, chapter 3. Thank you.